Good morning. I think we're live right now. So uh, it's been uh, it's been a couple days. I had um, had some time off on the weekend, feeling relaxed, feeling refreshed. Uh, time to get back to learning quantum mechanics. So let me just recap. I've been doing this a lot at the beginning of each of these things, just recapping, but I think it's useful considering I imagine that very, very few people are probably watching the whole thing. So what am I doing? Well, I'm interested in learning quantum mechanics and I was interested in particular of getting some kind of intuition for the math behind quantum mechanics. And I don't really expect that, you know, in a short period of time I can master something that physicists spend you know, years learning, but I'm hoping that I can make some serious progress in a short period of time. And so uh, my choice for how to do this was to take uh, one of MIT's open coursework classes. I was familiar with this. I did this during the MIT challenge, so I already know that I like the materials. I like how they set up the classes. I find the classes to be challenging and rigorous as opposed to just glossing over a lot of the things that are hard or a lot of things that are, um, you know, the nitty gritty of what actually makes something like that interesting. So I decided to learn 804. Now there's some challenges with learning 804. One, uh, I don't have all the prerequisites, so in particular, I'm missing 803. So they, the numbers for MIT classes very nicely go up in sequence. You have 801, 802, 803, and then 804. And I have done 801 and 802, but I have not done um, 803. And in addition, the ones that I have done the prerequisites, I did about eight years ago. So single variable calculus, multivariable calculus, differential equations, um, all of these things were done so long ago that there's a lot of, I don't want to say relearning, but a lot of refreshing at the very least. So some examples of that is I'm doing some questions and I'm getting things where the integral has to be solved with integrating by parts. Well, I don't quite remember all the details for integrating by parts. So that means I'm looking some things up. Same thing, uh, I have to do, you know, Taylor expansion to figure out some of the behaviors in these equations. Okay, so I gotta go back and do that. Not to mention lots of little details. So this is a hard class, and last week was clear evidence that you know I'm I'm pushing myself doing this class. I don't want to say that it's a hard class objectively. Difficulty is always relative, right? So it all depends on what your background is, how much time you're spending, what your abilities are, what your strengths and weaknesses. And so for an MIT student, for instance, who maybe all this stuff is fresh and they have done 803 and they have been working on this and they've been doing problems since very recently, I don't believe necessarily that this class is some mythical class that would be super difficult compared to other MIT classes in the physics track. However, uh, it's also something that if you have not taken any of these classes before, so if you're watching this and you have not done any calculus or you have not done any uh, college level physics, then it might be impossible to understand any of the things that I'm saying. So we have kind of a spectrum here of if you've gotten a lot of prep, maybe you've even taken quantum physics before from a different university, then this might be super easy for you. On the other hand, we have people who maybe have not taken any calculus or not taken the prerequisites. And so for them, it might be impossible. So I'm sitting somewhere between the range of trivial and impossible. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm on the difficult end. So I'm on the end that this is difficult there's a good chance that I might not be able to uh, get to the level of understanding and depth that I want to do in a month's time. But part of that is exciting for me because I like to challenge myself and I like to try things that are hard. And so I'm going to keep working at it. I'm going to keep working at seeing how far I can go in a month. Um, my hope is that I can go far enough to pass and hopefully get a good grade on the final exam. I have one practice exam. Um, but uh, it's, you know, it's just, it's a starting process, right? And so we'll just see how far I can get. And I am going to have to go back and kind of like drill down some of the foundations. But the, the main thing I just like to put across here is that although I can focus on, you know, success and failure in very black and white terms, there's a lot of learning going on. Every single day I'm learning more. And so I'm getting closer to my end goal, which was to have a good picture of the math. And so the question is just how far I'm going to get. And that's really what we're after here. But I think it's important, you know, even for yourself, when you're learning things, when you're studying things, obviously you maybe have some test is coming up. You have some exam, you have some uh, big goal that you're trying to reach. And that can kind of make you anxious. It can make you stressed out about, oh, geez, I, like, I don't know whether I'm going to reach that criteria that I have or that 
benchmark that I'm trying to reach. And obviously I want, you know, having that benchmark encourages you and motivates you to study, but it can also demotivate you if it's too much, if it's too high. And so I like to try to keep in mind the fact that every single hour you spend studying, you're making progress. Everything you're doing, you're making progress. You are doing learning, you're doing that. And so sometimes it's just the case that you do not have the background or the experience or the time to be able to make the progress that you wanted to make in that short period of time to reach whatever goal you would set. But I'm especially, because I'm doing this for self-education purposes, it's important to realize that these benchmarks are mostly there motivationally. Like what we're really trying to do is just trying to get a better understanding, trying to learn deeper. And so regardless of what happens in this month period, I'm gonna make a lot of progress. Now, how far that progress goes, is just going to depend a little bit on not only the techniques I use and the work ethic I put in, which I'm trying to do my best on both of those, but also the background. So it's definitely possible. I don't want to say it's impossible. It's definitely possible in theory that I might not be able to pass this final exam just because I have to do too much background learning of concepts that are either, you know, rusty or that were from a class that I didn't study or I just need to do more practice than I have time for. That, that is possible. I don't want to say that's going to happen, but I, I want to illustrate that that's possible and that it wouldn't keep me from working on this project because even if, let's say, I get to this end of this month's challenge and, you know, I fail the final exam, I, I'm not able to pass it. Even if that happens, I have no doubt that there's been a lot of learning along the way building up those skills. So that means that if I come back at it, and I work again, you know, maybe not right now, I have this big chunk of time, but maybe, you know, a few weeks, I just put in a little bit more time, a little bit more time, and I build up, I can get to that benchmark. So I want, I want to encourage you to think of your own learning that way, of not viewing it in this black and white lens of failure and success, but viewing it as progress and realizing that what matters for progress is putting in the time, putting in the effort, and, and using effective techniques. Now, I do think that in once you know what the techniques are, it's mostly about the effort. However, sometimes it is possible to get caught in bad techniques. I know a lot of students who do a lot of passive review, so they spend most of their time studying by just rereading things, which in a physics class is not going to work, not going to cut it. Um, but as long as you're using decent techniques, then it's mostly about maintaining the motivation, not getting frustrated, not like not giving up because it's hard, not giving up because it's difficult. And so for me, a big reason for picking this class and a big reason of deciding to do things this way was to pick something that was going to be hard for me. So you could see what it's like for me to struggle, what it's like for me to take a class that, uh, I find challenging. And if you do get a chance to look at any of the videos, from uh, last week, if you just jump into any parts of doing problems, you see a lot of me staring hmm, at the screen because I don't even know where to start on some of these problems. Or I, I write down a few of the equations and I'm like, no, nothing's coming to me. And so it's challenging. But the thing too is that every time I do one of these problems, then I look at the solution where I go between pieces of the solution and go back to trying it out myself. Okay, we've gotten a hint. Can I get a bit further? Going back and that struggle um, I'm making progress. And so this is what I really want to try to communicate with you. And I think that's particularly true when you're doing some kind of self-education project like this, where you are uh, setting your own benchmarks, you're setting your own goals, that there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking on a class or a challenge that's super hard that you might bomb at, that you might, you know, not do that well, and just try to push through as far as possible. So uh, in terms of where we are in in the actual class, we finished the first 10 lectures. There's 24. We finished the first 10. And we finished the first four problem sets, of which there are 10. So we're we're kind of about the same, sort of like a little less than halfway, and we've done the first week. And that doesn't mean we're halfway done learning. Obviously, it was a lot of struggle, these problem sets. So even if I get everything done by the end of this week, which I'm hoping to get done all the lectures by Friday, that's sort of my informal goal right now. Uh, and then hopefully problem set sometime mid or, or late next week. So even then where we have like another 10 days left, uh, that's still not, like there's still a lot of, um, still a lot of studying to do. There's still a lot of work to be done. 
uh, even after we finished all of the things because I have to go back and really master this. Uh, a big difference between this and MIT students is that I do have access to the solutions. So whereas an MIT student wouldn't have access to solutions, but they could maybe talk to a recitation instructor, they could talk to their professor, they could talk to their classmates to get kind of hints or suggestions or ways forward prior to working on the thing. I only have the solutions. So really, I kind of need that to get unstuck. But on the other hand, it is also good feedback. So, um, so for me, having finished the problem sets is not the same indication of mastery that it would necessarily be for an MIT student who, you know, unless they're totally cheating, unless they're totally just copying answers from someone else, likely had to, you know, get a lot closer to doing all the work to understand it before they could even submit the assignment. So there is going to be some going back. There is going to be some mastery of uh, previous concepts. And so given where I'm at right now, what is my plan going forward? And I always like to pause and sort of say to myself, what is my plan? And then I adjust that plan based on how things are going. So again, it's, it's a little hard to see in the overview, but if you have been kind of pausing it a little bit, you'll see that it's not like I set a plan on day one and I've just been following it meticulously. There is sort of a dialogue back and forth. So I did get to the, the 10th lecture. That was something I did and I started working on the problem sets. I've been kind of hesitating a lot about whether I want to work up to the end of the problem sets and just push through them all or whether I want to like take a break and go back to some a few foundational concepts and try to nail them either with Feynman techniques, re-watching other videos, uh, doing other little practice things to nail it. In the end, I've decided to just keep working on the problem sets, even though they're super challenging, just because I feel like I, they're they're kind of helping me learn um, in the most effective way right now. Uh, so my goal at the moment is to finish problem set five. This is going to get me caught up so that the lectures and problem sets were now in sync. And once I finish problem set five, my hope is that until tomorrow morning or till end of tomorrow morning, I'm going to just work on Feynman techniques for some of the important concepts. Now, I wrote down a big list here. I can show you, uh, if I show, send my desktop camera here. I, I made a big list of all of the concepts that I am struggling with, that are hard for me, uh, that kind of came up in doing this class. Uh, I, I'm probably not gonna do all of these. Some of them, it just might be that, you know, well, actually, I didn't know that, but I did the problem, so it's it's helping a little bit, or they're quite specific, and so they're not worth doing. But some of the other ones, I think, are worth getting a really good um, understanding of. So I've got some here, some techniques. I think I need to get a little bit more refreshed in kind of how to approach some of these differential equations, how to approach some of these um, math problems, and just sort of wrap my head around, okay, I have some given... Uh, integral or get some given thing that I'm like, I have no idea how to solve this, what would be the starting points? What would be, okay, well, let's try this or let's try that or let's try this. So we've got a few things that have come up, um, uh, substitution of variables, changing the order of integration, integrating by parts, Taylor expansion. Um, there's probably a few more that I'm going to add here once we get to some differential equations parts. So I want to get a little bit more of a grasp of those techniques so that I can just apply them rather than being like, when I see the solution, oh, okay, they're doing that, right? Um, some other things, these are some concepts that came up in the problem sets that I'm a little fuzzy on, or or were, like a lot of these, like the phase and group velocity, um, the diffraction, these are largely from 803, so I was struggling with those because I didn't actually really cover them that much. Um, there's some stuff from the lectures that even watching the lecture, I had a hard time following, so, solving the time evolution of the Schrodinger equation with sort of that brute force method, and then also this raising, lowering operator method um, were things that, you know, I was able to follow it, but there's a lot of steps where I don't, sh I don't know exactly what motivated them to make a certain decision to do certain things. And then there's some concepts, which I feel like I kind of have a, like a weak grasp on, but I think are so important, I'd really like to nail down. So these include things like superposition, um, understanding the commutator. I've been working with the algebra, the commutator a fair bit, but I'd like to kind of get a better physical analogy of, you know, what what is the commutator doing in some kind of visual analogy, if, if that's possible. And then um, the whole idea of superposition is that we're taking these wave functions and decomposing them along various bases 
And one thing that's been coming up a lot is linear independence for the bases or, or the um, for the uh, states in the bases and our states in the in the function as well as orthonormality and um, and these eigenfunctions which is something again I have like kind of a weak grasp on I get the idea that you know orthonormality means that uh, if you want to build out a function you can't um, like for instance if you're building a function out of sines and cosines you can't make uh, you know, you can't make the, the cosines out of the sine function because one's even, one's odd, so you're never going to be able to do it. And so, therefore, these are kind of, um, if we're considering a Fourier transform, though, all the different phases of um, the complex uh, exponentials are the kind of basis because you need all of them to build out those functions. And so I think I want to get a better picture of that because orthonormality is sort of easy to visualize when we're talking about linear algebra because it's just, you know, vectors at right angles. It's a lot harder when you're like, well, this is a bunch of an infinite number of sine waves and they're all orthogonal to each other. So, I mean, it can be a little bit challenging. And I'm also just using this sheet uh, to just write down whenever I get other things that I feel like I'm not perfect on. And then I have this sheet to go on when I start doing the finding techniques. So I'm just going to take two seconds to just uh, answer some questions from the comments. And then I'm going to jump back into problem set five because I think that's probably the best thing I can be doing right now to improve my understanding of this subject. So, uh, so one of the people saying, how do, how do I look at math? Um, well, I would say it's just like this. I try to do uh, problem sets and when I, the problem sets are a big source of developing understanding. Uh, I don't wanna say, don't treat them as just a test. Don't treat them as just, well, if I failed, then it was that I shouldn't have done that or I should have gone and done some learning first. The, the problem sets very often that feedback is how you're learning it. So I've learned a lot just doing the problem sets over the, the next few days. The other thing I try to focus on is um, really things should make sense. So when you're doing things and you see a solution, don't just be like, well, I guess that's how you solve it and let's memorize it. It should really be, well, why was that the right way to do that? Why should that have been obvious? Why should I be motivating those things? And then I would say even further than that, you're trying to get analogies, you're trying to get visual intuitions, you're trying to get some kind of, some kind of picture that makes what you're doing make sense. So, um, <laughs> very simple as we track some messages. I, I did see some of his messages there. Just to let you guys know, I, I'm not able to always reply immediately when you ask questions. So if you leave a question up there and I don't reply to it immediately, doesn't mean it was a dumb question, doesn't mean you have to be you know, shy and, and delete it after. Just leave it up and when I get a chance, I'll go back and I'll try to um, answer things here. All right, so let's go forward with our problem set five. Now, I did do a little bit of Feynman techniques. I just did just a small one on phase and group velocity yesterday. Um, I still have not installed Java, so uh, I'm not going to be able to work on those problems uh, today, or, I, or maybe I can install it at lunchtime and get back this afternoon. Um, one thing that's been a little bit challenging that I wasn't anticipating with this live stream project is some people have been asking me why I'm focusing on the textbooks instead of watching lectures um, for, um, you know, when I'm not understanding something, I could just watch a lecture video. Like if I do a Google search for Taylor expansion, the first things that comes up are like Khan Academy and other videos. And the problem with doing this live stream is I have to be very aware of copyright. I mean, technically the textbooks I'm doing are also copyrighted. But I'm showing only samples of them and you know YouTube is not going to use their algorithm to detect things whereas they will detect the audio from things and that might trigger a takedown or that might trigger taking some of my videos down so I have to be very careful about the uh, licenses now the MIT uh, the, sorry the MIT videos have a Creative Commons uh, non-commercial license so given the fact that this channel doesn't have any advertisements on it and I'm not using it for promotional purposes um, I can, you know, play those videos and you can see me learning from them. Whereas a lot of other videos, particularly if they don't have that copyright attribution, I, I'm trying to avoid using materials that I can't show on the camera, but that might frustrate things. That might make things a little harder. So if I really get stuck and I have to like watch some videos and I don't have those licenses, I might pop in the headphones and just like put up a little message explaining what's happening. 
um, just because it, it, that's a challenge that I'm having live streaming that you obviously won't have when you're when you're just doing your normal studies. All right, so let's go over to um, problem set five here. Uh, this is problem set one. Uh, this is problem set five. And I'm also going to have the solutions in another window here. Now, is this visible? I think it's visible. I know that it's been a little bit, um, it's been a little bit difficult sometimes for everyone to see what I'm doing here. Unfortunately, there's not too, too much I can do about that. It's the problem of like trying to compress everything into a 720p video when these are PDFs that have very small symbols. Uh, I've also been finding Chrome sometimes, which is driving me crazy, but Chrome sometimes uh, does not render the latex equations in the PDFs quite right. And so if I don't highlight them, the equals become minus signs or there's symbols submitted. So that's a double reason that this is a little bit challenging. If you want to follow these problem sets, um, the 804 spring 2013 session is where I'm getting all of this. So if you want to see like, well, what is he looking at? You just Google MIT OCW 804 spring 2013, just jump to the problem sets. Like this is problem set five, for instance, and you will be able to look at the PDF. So none of this, none of these materials I'm using, uh, at least not the ones that are, um, that are not in the textbook, all the digital ones. These are just things that you can uh, look up yourself. So we were doing this problem earlier on Friday and I was getting stuck and because I was getting stuck uh, it was it was nearing the end of Friday I was a little tired and I decided instead of looking at the answers I wanted to just give another shot tackling this problem the next day now this is something that's kind of tricky and it's uh, like I guess kind of have a feel for it but generally I want to work as hard as I can on a problem before looking at the answers um, I know sometimes people have been asked, well, why not just get feedback right away? But the reason why is because I only have, let's say, about 10 problem sets with solutions to them. And so if I just immediately look at the answer, I will learn how to do these problems. That is correct. And it will be somewhat faster. But I will not have experienced, at the very least, what it was like to actually think through solving it. Because for many of these problems, once you know what the solution is, it's quite easy. You know, uh, the hard part is figuring out how would you have, with without that information, gotten to that solution. And so the ideal, I think, practice ratio would be for me to get a few more problems right than I have been getting right. So I'm a little bit still on the more difficult end for this. At the same time, uh, I feel like this is the fastest way for me to learn it is, is going to be to use these problem sets. So if I run out of problem sets and I don't have as much that have uh, provided solutions, then I might just have to sort of dig around and see what I can do. So this question in particular, I was working on it. I was feeling a little bit fuzzy. Um, so one of the things I could have done is just jumped over to the solution and been like, oh, okay, that's how you do it. But I was, I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to give another shot at it, another clean go. So let's let's just start by uh, jotting down the problem set name. And uh, let's look at question number one, the probability current. So this um, J function, uh, I don't know whether there's a better way of putting it, but this kind of fancy J is the probability current. And we, I did feel like I understood that from this before, because I did start working on this problem here. And essentially what you can see is that if you start at time zero, you have some kind of function like this, let's say. You can imagine a range where there's a certain mass, certain mass of stuff in this function. And then time zero, let's say the function flattens out, there's less mass in here because the, it, obviously it normalizes. So if it's flatter and you're considering the same bounds, there's gonna be less stuff in there. And so the time derivative of this bounded area is essentially how much probability is flowing out of that area in a given unit of time. Now, once we get to thinking of this infinite infinitesimally, 
we can see that uh, this is the amount of um, probability that is flowing out of you know any particular point, how much sort of flow there is. So we could imagine it almost like, um, uh, I guess, kind of like, I don't know whether we want to say it's a vector because I don't know whether there's a direction component associated with it. Um, but I, yeah, so I don't want to say that it's a vector, like in that there's kind of like, you know, the way that there would be with like other flows of things. Because it's not like the probability is necessarily flowing from one point to another. It's just going up and down in a particular region. But you can kind of imagine it that way that this is measuring some, measuring some, uh, the amount that the probability is either increasing or decreasing in that part for per unit time. So uh, what we're trying to show is that this function uh, can be expressed as the uh, IH bar over 2M multiplied by this psi uh, d psi prime over, uh, or sort of the um, spatial derivative of the complex conjugative psi minus the complex conjugative psi times the spatial derivative of psi. So we were trying to figure out how we can uh, figure this out. So we got a few hints here. Hint, what is P, A, B in terms of psi, X, and T? And then remember that time derivatives of psi and T are determined by the Schrodinger equation. And then use integration by parts as often as you need. So we've got three little hints there um, that we can apply. Hold on a second. I'm just going to draw this down here. Oh, all right. So what do we have? Um, okay, so let's start with this hint right here, which is saying, what is P, A, B, T in terms of psi, X, and T? So P, A, B is going to be the integral from A to B of Px dx. Oh, this is uh, yeah, this is so if this is t, hold on a sec, I just want to make sure I get my parameters right here. Okay, and then if if this is the integral of this, then we know that um, because this is just the norm squared, we have um, psi it just that just follows from the equation. And then uh, we need to do, so when you're integrating two things that are multiplying each other, you can do integration by parts. Now, this was one of the things that I put on my, um, I don't want to say to learn list because I did, I have learned this before, but kind of a to master to understand because I do even remember integrating by parts being kind of confusing for me even during the MIT challenge. So let's look up. Integrating by parts, I even closed a tab where I had it open already. So let's just get the formula here for integrating by parts because we will, at a later junction, try to understand this a little better. But basically, we have u and v, which in this case is uh, psi star and psi. And then b. this is equal to psi... Um, or sorry, u, excuse me, u, uh, u and v dx minus u prime v dx dx. Okay, so let's try this out. Uh, okay, we've got, oh, we got to put the, um, let's just write down the formula here first. So it's, uh, so I'll be let 
u equal this, and v equal sorry, x and t. Although, of course, I could have done them in any order, and I might need to. So u, so we're going to have psi star of uh, x and t. Excuse me. No, I guess I'm just putting them directly in. I'm not even substituting, but if you just scratch this off, I guess. Now I'll just leave it, whatever. Um, this is this. Times. Bounce is in here. And then this is V, which is again psi T. DX is there. I always forget the DX. All right, um, does this get us any closer? Well, let's go back to our question here. Do we, do we, we want to get it in this form. How can we get it in that form? Well, we know that this momentum operator is doing something with this IH bar. So I'm wondering whether that has anything to do with this here. Hmm, okay. This is not super forthcoming. I was hoping that I would see something when I did this that would make it kind of clear. Like, I mean, we do have the, we do have this, this, uh, d psi dx, but now we got a bunch of other stuff that's not necessarily going to make this easier. Um, hmm. Okay. Uh, all right, let's remember the other thing it says here, which is remember that time derivatives are determined by the Schrodinger equation. So let's put down the Schrodinger equation and see if we get anything um, helpful from that. I need to actually jot down some of these equations, I think, on a piece of paper because I'm spending a lot of time flipping back and forth here. Okay, so that's the energy operator. energy operator is okay okay here we go so Schrodinger equation so I'm just gonna put Schrodinger equation here uh, is equal to 
i h bar e t psi is equal to this, which is h squared over 2m is vx psi. All right, so this is our Schrodinger equation here. Just indicates how this evolves in time. Um, so what do we see here that might be useful? Well, we've got the 2m here, and we've got this ih bar. And we know that this is this here. So how can we, maybe we can put this together and, and, and try to get this form of the equation here. Um, Mm -hmm. How are we going to get this over there? We don't know anything about the potential functions. So there's not really much we can do with that. Um, we have a second spatial derivative here. I'm not quite sure how to... Uh, there's only, we only have a single spatial derivative in this thing. Maybe let's put the uh, integration by parts aside and focus on this for a second. Because we have psi complex conjugate times psi x of t dx is going to be equal to PAB. Well, let's actually get the dp dA. Oh, okay, okay. So we're trying to do this, but we are forgetting that it's dPAB. So over dt is going to be equal to um, the uh, time. So d dt of this. And I think, because we're integrating over x, I don't think there's going to be a problem to do this. Which would be if we're if we're taking this time derivative, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that's going to be a problem because these are different variables. Um, I think that makes sense. Hopefully I'm not making a mathematical error there. And so let's, let's try this again. But let's move it with um, these size. So we have the psi star or dt. I'm not going to put the x's and t's in here. I think I'm just going to do the so we've got this. But we know that if we divide by ih bar here that we know what this is. Uh, and I believe we should know what the complex conjugate is as well, because that's just put a star on all these things. So let's try um, substituting in here the Schrodinger equation, but divide by this ih bar. So we can have is equal to um, h bar squared over 
i to n h bar. Uh, bar, uh, which is going to be equal to, we get rid of the h bar here and the h. Uh, so we have, let's just change it to a minus sign. So we have minus i h bar over 2m x squared is i. Um, plus bx psi divided by ih bar. So this is this, is also this with the complex conjugates. So let's see if we can't uh, pull it out here. Uh, Minus h bar two m d psi star d x squared. Plus Uh, let's get the conjugates there. And then we have the same thing here. Minus i h bar over 2m. Okay, all right, so informally, just looking at this, I see some things. Well, first of all, we've got a second spatial derivative, which when we integrate over it, is going to be a, um, a what? Uh, it's going to be um, uh, um, a, a, sorry, a, um, a single spatial derivative. So that's going to probably match up with this thing over here. Um, and then the this thing here is, is just a regular integral. So I'm a little nervous that we're going to not end up with, uh, with this guy. And we've got the we got this negative i h bar over two m, which is uh, not exactly the form we wanted, but it's to assign with this front coefficient. So that's also something interesting. This uh, potential function, which we just have generically in the energy function, and I don't we don't have any properties of this. Um, for for this function, so this must be this these v's must get cancelled out, and they must get removed at some point. So otherwise, we're um, we're going to be stuck. Now, there's a couple possibilities. One, we could try to do integrating by parts with this as u and this as v. Uh, that's one possibility. Another possibility is that we use FOIL, multiply these things out, and then we've got some, you know, some kind of quadratic from linearity. We break it apart and then maybe do integration again. I'm leaning that way. I think that's probably the way to do it. Um, 
We do remember that this DBDT is going to be JA minus JBT. Uh, so I think that's just going to come out of this, of these integral bounds. Because when we evaluate the definite integral from A to B, we just minus A minus B. So if we change this to just um, having a, uh, just a, just a general integral, we should get this, um, this expression should just come out, I think. So, all right. Um, so let's try it. Let's try multiplying it out from A to B. Um, hmm. Okay, so we're going to have this multiplied by this is going to be um, Is there any simplification I can do there? Hmm. Are we going the right direction? Well, sometimes you guys just gotta try it and see whether it works. All right. So negative i times negative i. Well, i times i is negative one. Negative times negative. Negative. So this should be just a total negative term. Uh, so negative h bar squared over 4m squared the uh, oh this is the spatial second spatial derivative in x psi oh i should put the squares here um all right, and then we have uh, this times this, and this times this is gonna be two, so we can get rid of the two in the M term. So it's gonna be minus, this is an overall minus, but I times I, so it's gonna be an overall positive. So let's go plus, um, Oh, no, we can actually, sorry, we've got these ones on the bottom, too. So let's just do one here. So we've got these cancel. You get a negative 1. So it's going to be uh, negative 1 over 2m. But we're going to have two of them, so let's get rid of the 2. So it's just going to be uh, minus 1 over m. Actually, no, we can't do it this way because these are not... The same. We've got one this complex conjugate each. All right, so let's do it just one at a time then. So this one multiplied by this is going to be uh, minus one over two m. And then plus, actually, we can just change this to a minus. Minus. Uh, minus these, which is going to be. Vx squared. I don't think it's going to, so this is, yeah, negative one. Uh, all 
Okay. And then dx. Well, because integration is linear, we should be able to separate all this out. So let's just separate it out. I guess I can just pull these things out to the front. Let's just take a look at where we're at right now and see if anything is a little bit more illuminating from this perspective of having worked this out. All right. Um, This is going to be this probability times this uh, potential function here. But I don't know. We don't really want it in terms of probabilities. So that's going to be annoying. I was saying that these Vs would have to get kicked out at some point. But it's not looking super obvious how that's going to happen. Hmm. So one thing that I've noticed is that I try to be careful when I get into like complicated situations like this, because when you get into something complicated like this, first of all, it's very easy to make algebraic mistakes. It's harder to see what, it's harder to just look at it and be like, okay, this is what's going to happen. And it's very easy to spend a lot of time doing calculations and not actually get that much further with solving the problem. So in this particular uh, question, we had um, this, which was this, which we expanded to these two using the Schrodinger equation. Um, and then we just multiplied it all out and then we separated the integrals. What if we tried it from the other direction and see if we get something that looks familiar from there? Like what if we tried taking this JXT and JAT minus JBT and see if uh, I'm not sure that's really gonna help. Hmm. All right, well let's let's try it. 
see if anything looks more familiar. We get some pieces that we think we might be able to put something together with. <clears throat> so we know that it's J A T minus. Actually, uh, yeah, okay, all right. Actually, I don't think we need this because if we just ditch this A, B stuff here, like if we just take these as integrals so that the, you know, time derivative of this, this like D, P, A, uh, let's, let's D, P, put it this way, dp dt ought to be equal to this, right? Like this is kind of almost definitionally true. Let's put three here for this. Like this, this should be definitionally true. So if this is just definitionally true, then I don't know whether we need to work back backwards from that. All right. All right, all right. Where are we now? Hmm. Hmm. So I'm not sure how we get rid of this thing here. write my iteration by parts. Just as a reference. So we have U V D X becomes U V D X minus U prime U Oh, so B DX oops. DX DX, I think that's right. Yeah. So one question I have right now is uh, I'm not sure if you take two different functions that are their second derivative and you multiply them together. Can we just take the, uh, like are these just gonna be the first derivatives multiplied by each other? It seems like a, seems like a safe assumption, but I'm not sure whether that's actually true. Doesn't seem like we're getting closer to this form though of the equation where we have a psi times, you know, or we have a wave function times the spatial derivative of a wave function. Because here, well, let's see what it looks, let's, let's just try to expand one of these terms into um, with integration by parts and see if that see if that reveals anything. So let's let's take one of these guys. So it's gonna be one over two m. I'm gonna just drop the a and b because I think that's gonna make it a bit easier on me. So 
is, uh, yeah. These guys are... So if we did integration by parts on this, let's say, I think this would be the thing we'd want to be u. So this would be vx psi times I'm just going to use this simpler, simpler notation. Oh, we want uh, this is u prime, so we're going to have. Okay, so this is going to be potential of psi times, and then this is just going to be uh, d psi star dx, and this is going to be minus vx. This just turns into, I'm going to just leave this here. This turns into Vx psi uh, derivative of that. Maybe I'll just change this to uh, Vx right here. Dx, oh, sorry, times. Uh, and this we just get the psi star dx dx. So what do we have here? Um All right. This is going to be, uh, all right, we're going to multiply by two terms here. So we're going to have z prime. I actually don't want to do prime because we've got two variables here. So I'm going to do. I believe v is only a function in x. I think we can do prime. It's pretty safe. Vx psi plus Vx psi psi and uh, is it d psi? dx multiplied by d side prime dx dx okay interesting all right so what do we have now we have dx psi d side prime dx minus 
So I can just put a plus. Do I want to separate them out? I guess there's no harm. Plus V of X e psi X psi star X DX. Um Well, hmm. well, I feel like we've made some progress because now we have this, like this psi, this thing here. I mean, some progress. This is still. Still kind of a mess. Hmm. What do I have from before here? Well, um, We took the equation here and got this, the time derivative, or sorry, basically the, yeah, time derivative of this probability function over time, plugged in this, got this. And we tried taking one of these terms and seeing what happened when we did integration by parts uh, here. And I mean, we get some factors that look like what we need, but a bunch that don't, not to mention this potential function is still causing us issues. I think having spent about 50, 45 minutes on this, I think it's about time to uh, get a little closer and, and look at what the start of the solution is to see if we can't get a little bit of a hint. So I'm going to just zoom in so I don't look at it too much. Oh, this is a little bit annoying here. Um, you know what? I'm going to just bring this up like this. I know that it's going to distract this window a little bit. but This is a little bit annoying. Here, okay. So we wish to prove that d b a t is equal to this, since p a b t is the probability of finding the particle in the range a is less than x is less than b at time t. It is mathematically equal to. Okay, which is what we had. Its time derivative is therefore given by Oh, you know what? 
this, this right here, first mistake right there. I should have done the uh, product rule and I forgot. So let's write that down here. So let's see what we have for, for product rule here we have. It's equal to Well, all right, now if we go back here, unfortunately it's a little bit annoying to, uh, is this all visible here? I think. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is all visible. Let me just see if I can. Unfortunately, this is a little annoying to uh, switch between these things here. I think. Okay. So let's try again. Okay, well here we had just me being uh, not thinking straight. I just multiplied this out and I did this in one step and I forgot about product rule for uh, differentiation. So we've got, um, this is the, uh, the correct way of doing this function. So let's just see if we can get something closer to what we need. So, um, we've got these, which are time derivatives, and we want the spatial derivatives here. So let's just write this out a little bit differently. Oh, I'm going to switch to pencil again because I'm doing my work now. All right, uh, dx. Now, since we've got this here, we can put in that Schrodinger equation, which we had from before. Equal to, what do we have? H bar over two M I. Bounds over here. Psi squared dx squared plus plus. 
this. I'm just going to put dot, dot, dot here because it's, uh, it's going to just be the opposite of that. And uh, so. See if we can push these things out. So this one here is going to be oh my um, sine conjugate double spatial derivative of psi plus. Now here, hmm. what do we have here? We have, uh, Oh, we can separate these out again. So I'm just going to put plus, I'll just put this one over here for right now. And I'll just put the H bar over to my here just for clarity. And so if we have this, and we want to multiply it out, what would be the best way to do that? Well, what does integration by parts look for that? <laughs> so again, integration by parts, we have equal to uh, u v minus u prime. dx dx so if we were going to do this which one would we want to be the u well we would want the complex conjugate to be the u and this thing to be the v because it's going to get integrated over twice so let's try that so we would have i'm just going to put this all in like big big bracket here because this is all multiplied by this and just put the dot 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 here just because we're working with this one part. So we have psi complex conjugate. I guess I need to put this here. Psi squared dx squared uh, 
dx, dx. So what does this equal? Minus uh, well, this is going to become d psi dx, and then we have I guess we need this evaluated to a and b. Should put this like this, I guess. I just said I want to drop the terms here. I'm not sure how I should evaluate this because if you have like you have f of x prime g of x prime dx I mean it's not necessarily going to give you just f and g right Try doing it one more time with the <laughs> I did this one, which one was you, which uh, this guy was you. So that means I have. Dx. This also has to be EV, right? Uh, is equal to minus. Uh, 
and this becomes Hmm. I haven't really made much progress. I think it's time for another hint. Oh, again, I have to deal with this. All right. This is a little super annoying to do this on the screen, you know, I'm just going to zoom out here because otherwise it's going to just cause me so much headaches. All right, let's go here. Okay. Where we're allowed to take the time derivative inside the integral because the integral is in time or the integral is over space. Note though the total derivative became a partial derivative when we took it inside the integral. T only. Okay. Okay. In equation three. Uh, all right, so we did do that properly, but let's write things down here. Minus let me just write this down so we have DPAB equal to 1 over ih bar. squared 2m Right. <clears throat> this is what we had, I believe. Yep. Um, How is this different?
Okay, let's read it a little further because I think this is what I had. Equals uh, h bar b. Minus over to M sine complex conjugate squared <coughs> sine x squared minus psi squared sine star over x squared. <coughs> I star v psi minus v psi star. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Okay, so these guys are canceling, I guess. Oh yeah, I didn't I didn't expand this fully, so that's why I didn't see that. So these guys are gonna cancel. I'm gonna have this. Excuse me for a second. Oh, allergies. All right. Um, so I think then we're going to have to see, so you know what, I'm going to again, pause it, go back to this. Let's see if we can work it from here. Um, so this is roughly what we had from before, I believe, but it's just been kind of rearranged into a different format. Is this what we had from before? Yeah, this is what we had from before. So, Yeah, okay, so we're gonna have to look at the answer because that's what we had. All right, next one. Okay, so this gets eliminated. Close to I H bar for two M A B. Psi complex conjugate. And it's a psi. Psi square. Dx. All right. Um, where the last equality is the fact that because position is space. Both commutes. F G A B minus. Okay, that's. <clears throat> That's what we <clears throat> that's what we were doing. Um, this means
This is eight this should have an H bar here, right? Yeah, I don't know why it's not displaying sometimes some of the things, but that should be an H bar. So IH bar over 2M. Uh, and then we have what? Let's go jump right down to 7B. Minus sine. X plus A, B, C, D, sine, X, D, sine, X, So, um, hmm. so they had this, uh, this term right here and they just, just eliminated it. Um, So I'm a little confused about that, of how we justify just eliminating that. Like I understand, oh, 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 because one's negative and one's positive here. Jeez, mm. okay, well, this is a tricky one. All right, because one of them is positive and one of them is negative. So my problem in doing this equation is that I wasn't doing the whole thing, so I didn't see the parts that canceled each other out. How are we getting negative there on one and positive on the other here? Okay, all right. So we canceled a bunch of stuff to get to that point. So, oh. So now if we go back over to here and we see, and we're trying to figure out what is the uh, units of this. Let's just figure it out. We have it's h bar over mass times uh, units of. Uh, I'm just going to change this to kilograms. And this is going to be it's a one over root meters. And. Uh, this is going to be root meter divided by meter. Oh, and that's the same for both of these. Um, and so we can just ignore that. These cancel. We have h bar over kilograms times meters. And what are the units of h bar? Well, this is equal to 
joules times seconds. Joules, remember, is force times meters, which is equal to F equals, F equals MA. So this is kilograms times meters. Sorry, force, yeah. Kilograms times meters divided by second squared times meters times seconds. So this is seconds cancels, the kilograms cancel, and uh, we have meters squared here, meters on the bottom. Are we ending up with, no, we're ending up with, uh, I'm seeing meters per second, but this is not right. This is saying it's times, where am I missing one? Meters per second squared, meters per meter squared. Uh, oh, they're just doing it from this calculation of dp uh, dt has to be equal to one over time because this is. Why is it not meters? Because isn't it per, per unit? Hmm. Okay. All right. Wow. Hard question. Let's go on to question number two. How many questions do we have here? Three, four. Uh, four questions. Okay. All right. All right. Two, visual observation of a quantum harmonic oscillator. An experimenter asked for funds to observe visually through a microscope the quantum behavior of a small oscillator. According to his proposal, the oscillator consists of an object of 10 to the negative 4 centimeters in diameter with an estimated mass of 10 to the negative 12 grams. It vibrates on the end of a thin fiber with a maximum amplitude of 10 to the negative three centimeters and frequency of 1000 Hertz. You're a referee for the proposal. The approximate quantum number for the system in the state described. <sighs> this one, I'm not even sure where to start. Okay. What is, what is the picture we're trying to visual observation? Boy, all right. Um, well, let's go back to our equations from earlier, which were about uh, the quantum harmonic oscillator from that class. Three, 
All right. I'm trying to imagine the state here. we have for the E0 voice and it's raising and lowering operator. This is very challenging. I'm not quite sure what to make of this one here. Um, I mean, eesh. okay. Let's go. Let's go over to our. Let's get over to our thing here. Uh, what are we? What are we looking at? An oscillator consists of an object. The estimated mass of this vibrates on the end of a thin fiber. Like, are we looking at something like this, where there's like, you know, some kind of object and it's going like back and forth, you know, like, is that what, this is what we're considering here? Like I, don't, I have no idea what to do here. Um, let's start with let's just let's see what kind of general things that we have. We, we know that uh, quantum number, I was in the thin fiber. Hmm. All right, I'm going to uh, I'm going to look at this a little bit because I'm not getting anything. So let's let's look at the answer just briefly. Let's zoom out of this here. Now. Let's see, able to see this. This is no, it's no good. So you guys see? Okay. So let's just look at the very start to see if we can just get some hint here. Hmm. Okay. So this is maybe some 803 stuff. I'm just going to put 803 question mark. Because I, all right. E is equal to one half. So 
So let's just try solving for this right now. See if we get any further here. Well, the mass we've got is uh, it's out of kilograms, that's going to be times another um, another three, so that's 10 to the negative uh, 15 kilograms. Frequency in hertz, I think we want it in radians now. Um, I think we want it in radians. Uh, amplitude negative three centimeters. Negative three centimeters here. So that's negative five meters. And this is what radians per second. Uh, quantum number. Well, a quantum number we're thinking of like, is this E0, E1, E, N, dot, dot, dot. So how do we figure out the quantum number for this? No, no, I'm not sure. All right, let's go Move forward here. Oh, okay, here, here. This is this is important. E to the n is equal to h bar may go zero and plus one half. All right, so let's go back. All right, h bar. to uh, F. meters. squared to the six that's the frequency so let's just uh, uh, 14 here and uh, sorry one second one each bar. I think this is the same omega zero, so let's just put that here. So we can cancel out. Kilogram meters per second, is that right? I kind of lost some of the units here. Um, and so we should be able to cancel this, cancel this. We should get h bar n plus one half is equal to one half 10 to the negative 14 millimeter per second. Uh, what is h bar? 
Ooh, HBAR. What was it? I think it's like 6.2 something, 6 point times 10 to the negative 31. Let's see if we can just get. All right. Here we go. So if we want to divide by two pi, it's 1.05 times 10 to the negative 34. One and a half. All right. And then you have n plus one half is equal to roughly 10 to the 20th. <coughs> roughly 10 to the 20th. So, yeah. N is very large. And then that will give us enough to answer these other questions. So what would the energy in electron volts who are in its lowest energy state? So that would be H bar of this N plus one half. Is equal to so if this n were uh, zero, it'd be one half h bar. Uh, so I'll just put uh, this is eight pi squared h bar times uh, ten to the third is equal to Point zero five times ten to the negative thirty one divided by e pi squared. Oh, pi squared is what ten. This is eighty. This is another two orders of magnitude. I'm just going to put. Uh, and then thermal energy. Actually, we can do this in terms of electron volts. Those Planck's constant electron volts per second. Negative 16. I'll just do joules too. Electron volts. Uh, is equal to plus eighteen right here, eighteen nineteen. This is like ten to the ten EV. Average thermal energy of air molecules. That's not 10 to the 10. Am I crazy here? This is 10 to the negative 10. So 10 to the negative 10 EV. <coughs> versus millielectron volts would be 2.5 times ten to the negative three. So this is 
seven orders of magnitude smaller. And then C, what would be the classical amplitude of vibration if it were in its lowest energy state? So if this were in its lowest energy state, we would have um, yeah, 10 to the negative 29, roughly, equal to 1 to half. Actually, I can get rid of these things here. I'll just change this to the previous number I had. So we can cancel these. And then this A goes 10 to the... <coughs> 10 to the 6, 10 to the negative 5. So let me just cancel, cancel, 14. This is about 1. <clears throat> and we need the amplitude. Oops. I'm just copying mindlessly here. That's a squared. Was it a squared? Yeah, a squared. Oh, I forgot to square this here. Okay, that's going to adjust this calculation. All right. Um, so this is now negative 9 plus 9, 1.05 times 10 to the negative 22 square root is going to be equal to ten meters no uh, no it will not show quantum effects All right, I, I, I should recalculate this because I um, forgot the a squared. <clears throat> so that makes this negative 10, which makes this minus 6, which makes this minus 21. Minus 21, 21, 21. 21. Uh, and then that's going to be 9, 13. Still very large, but not quite as large. All right, uh, let's look at the answer now. Yeah, okay. Uh, so this is right there. It's 3 times 10 to the 12. I have 10 to the 13 here. Um, okay, I have 10 to the negative 10. This is 10 to the negative 12. So it's not, not quite accurate, but again, we're ballparking here. Um, factor of 10 to the 10, so that's 10 orders of magnitude smaller. This is the width of the Gaussian supremacy wave function. Mm. 
No, no, no. Okay, so I don't have the right answer here. Let's write this down here. Oh, this was... Um, You know, uh, one is equal to um, a squared All right, two pi, two pi, two pi, because we've got to change this here. So this is going to be two pi v. Uh, oh, bro, I forgot the h bar. The h bar is not showing up on these things. And oh, this is the comparison of the two. Okay, so four hundred and eight. Oh, okay, okay. Because I had roughly ten to the negative eleventh meters. And what's this thing? Nanometers, 10 to the ninth. That's still not right, though. This becomes A is equal to point zero zero four nanometers. It's equal to 4 times 10 to the one, two, three. No? Okay, I think this is this is approximately right. I was only calculating it approximately. I forgot to add the light part. I would not recommend, yeah. Okay. All right, let's go forward now to part three. Harmonic oscillators oscillate harmonically. <laughs> okay. The mass, the particle of mass M and harmonic os oscillator potential has an initial wave function write down psi x t and psi norm squared psi x and t. All right, let's start with a simple one. Um, So it's going to be equal to psi so e hat So 
So if we take the energy operator on I of x and t, so if we actually take the energy operator on this whole jazz. this, right? I'm going to get this norm squared now. It's plus E zero E one I think that's right. Let's look see what the answer is. Ah, okay. So I did not get this to the right because I forgot the phase thing, I think.
Yeah, this is really annoying that they're forgetting some things on these PDFs. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let's try to see if we can get... Oh. Get the uh, probability distribution of this. So the norm squared oops. Well, what happens when we square this? here. One over root two. What's going to be this multiplied by its conju complex conjugate? So we're going to have one over root two times one over root two. And this is going to be e to the negative i
Uh, well, we're going to have one half, first of all. And then we're going to have... I should put the complex conjugates first. We're gonna have two, it just delimits the denominator here. E T and then we're gonna have these things, these cross terms here. So that's gonna be plus two I. Uh, negative i Actually, I can't do that because these are not the same. And plus, uh, I guess we can get rid of the uh, two there. See what we have here. Oh, geez. <laughs> I'm doing complex conjugation here, but I think we can. Can we just make this? Oh, actually, no. Wait, what am I doing? Oh, right, right. Um, Because when this becomes complex conjugate, it gets uh, a negative sign here or not. Here squared.
How did we get rid of the eyes on the Hmm. Okay. We're in this technology, the energy I can see is to be taken to be real, so. Ah. Boy, all right, B. Find the expectation value, X is a function of time T. Notice that it oscillates with time. What is the amplitude of the oscillation in terms of M and fundamental constants? What is this angular frequency? Parts here. Okay, there's only this one. All right. Uh, find the expectation value. as a function of time. So this corresponds to um, dx of psi star x operator psi uh, so this is going to be, uh, dx complex conjugates x this, which is going to be equal to dx Actually, because of the all real functions, I can do the same thing here. So this is one. Anything we can cancel here. Thank you. 
<laughs> so plus sorry. Because these are all multiplying, I think I can just pull the x out. Right? So. these two things. Uh, seems like the wrong way to do this. Uh, Feel like there's something I'm missing that would exploit this. Hmm. Excuse me one second. All right. Uh, I don't really want to multiply this whole thing out. Uh, is there any way I can avoid doing that? Um,
Do I want to do integration by parts? Seems like it's also going to be a bit of a mess. What's our parts from the unit of x? That's going to be 1, x plus. No, I don't think that's going to fix the problem. Yeah, I think I'm just going to have to try it out. Let's just try it out. Okay. I've got one fourth. Plus one fourth. This would be one half. Now what do we have? We have Plus we have sine squared omega t. Is that all the terms? This times itself times this. It's also times that first s this. Does anything simplify when we do this? Yeah, I feel like something should be simplifying, but it doesn't seem to be. Yeah, I'm gonna look at what we've got for the answer here. Okay. All right, so we did go from sort of the right approach, but I'm gonna rewrite what we did here because I had it as, I didn't break it apart, so. Hmm. 
Do we have anything more that we can say about this right now? Now seeing this, is there any further I can get on my own? Well, this is the expectation of this, and this is the expectation of that. Can we use symmetry to say this is zero? I mean, this is anti-symmetric. Because, like, what do we have here? We've got, like, some kind of harmonic thing. And then we've got the zero state and the, you know, it's like that, right? I think because of symmetry, uh, these are both going to be zero, no? Let me just add a question mark. Eliminated. And then all you're left with is uh, is this thing here. Let's see. We need to know something about the form of theta n, the nth excited. Okay. It's the nth Hermite polynomial, and A is defined as this. Since the Hermite polynomials are either even or odd, the eigenstates are also even or odd, which means that this and this are both even. Interns are odd, so. Okay, so yes, this is true. So this leads to the last term for which we will need the precise forms of the energy eigenstates. Okay. Wow, okay, this is tough. All right. So uh, we need to know the precise form of the energy eigenstates. Gives just get this one here because it's the same thing equals a over root two m omega naught. I sine omega t negative infinity positive infinity oh, x over a squared e to the negative x over a squared dx. How do we lose this square here? Oh, 
Oh, this is because this is the integral of a Gaussian. It's just going to be this. A, you know. Okay. Where are we getting this u squared from? Oh, he's just substitute variables here. Ah, oh, equals a squared. M, maybe not, two. Sine, omega zero t is equal to root over h bar, two m omega zero. So the question here is angular frequency. This is just another way of doing it, I guess. So this question here, um, I really think that the stuff that was covered in lectures eight and nine, which was about figuring out, let me go back to that. Uh, yeah, lectures eight and nine, where we were getting the kind of brute force and the raising and lower operator method to solve this harmonic oscillator, uh, that partial differential equation, that that was, um, that was the, something important to understand for being able to do this question more easily. Um, I was, I did get this idea right here, but I mean, it's, it's still, there's a lot of math here that kind of um, went over my head a little bit. So let's see, C, find expectation for momentum as a function of time. You know, I'm going to just leave a little thing here. I'm going to do these later because I'm a little concerned that I'm going to not fully understand this, try to go through C and D, and then kind of waste a little bit the uh, possibility of understanding that better and getting a better chance at answering those questions correctly. Show the probability distribution. Okay. So let's see four operators in the harmonic oscillator. I think it's time to go back and switch over to doing Feynman techniques for this because this right here is involving too much stuff that I don't think it's a question for that I don't really have an excellent handle on. 
And because I don't have an excellent handle on it, I'm kind of struggling a little bit here. So let me just write down from process horn five. Uh, it's actually going to be this right here, what we want to do. Okay. So, um, I think to be honest, probably the starting point is going to be understanding this brute force method of the, um, of basically what was covered in lecture eight. So I want to understand this process from here. to here. Okay. So let's get some pencil out right now. And we can just start doing this fine technique. Now I might <clears throat> probably not gonna be able to get too too far in this session for taking a little break. So let's do uh let's just write down the kind of basics of it. All right, this is gonna be a big one. And I think I'm gonna to try to, if I could get done this and the operator method, um, I would be pretty, uh, I would be pretty happy with this afternoon for this. So I'm gonna just put this, uh, close this right now. We're just gonna switch over to here. So I'm probably going to work on this mostly this afternoon, but let's try to lay out the basic foundation. So what is our starting point situation? Because this is something we should be able to express. Oh, here we go. So the harmonic oscillator situation. Uh... So this is, was the starting point for the harmonic oscillator. I think this might be again something from eight of three waves. Let's see if we can just start with kind of a basic jump over here, uh, basic definition of harmonic oscillator, just so we can. Okay. So let's start by writing down this. A harmonic oscillator a system whereby the drawing force is proportional to 
do the displacement. So uh, I think I think this would be like a spring. Where if it is stretched out more. Proportional to A. Um, so pendulums, mass connections to springs as well. So the pendulum is also a system like this for small angles. So if we have pendulum, I guess I want to draw it on an angle here, but yeah, we have a pendulum here. And uh, whether well, strong is proportional to the displacement distance K. I guess because this is uh, the restoring force is going, it's going down like this. And so that's proportional to this. Uh, maybe similar triangles here. I think that's the idea. Okay. So So we're not considering a damped harmonic oscillator, so that's nice, or a driven one. So if we go back to, um, from that lecture, and just, all right, I'm gonna write here. From lecture eight. Expressed. Harmonic oscillator in the form
So what does this mean? Um, you know, let me just put a little bookmark here so I'm not uh, having as much difficulty flipping between these two right now. So this is just energy. Let me put this. Where psi is an energy eigenstate the one half m omega squared x squared corresponds to V of X. Comparing to the generic energy eigenfunction. Uh, this represents the potential in the system. So why is it one half m omega squared x squared? So let's put a little pause right there and let's see if we can't find anything on harmonic oscillators in our goal of physics book. I'm going to see if there's anything in the quantum book because now we're talking about quantum mechanics. There might be something better in this, um, part of this, this particular one. Okay, so there is some stuff there. Let's just see if we have a table of contents here. The harmonic oscillator, 162. So I think I'm going to read this and then jump back. The simple harmonic oscillator potential. So can you guys see this? I might just, uh, I might just uh, switch to this. It's a little bit easier. Oh, my, oh, I'm hitting this thing here. It's knocking it around. This is very frustrating. I'm hitting my, there we go. A little cord that it comes with. Let's see if I can just take this over here. Very delicately. There we go. So I wanted it. All right. The simple harmonic oscillator potential Vx is equal to one half Cx squared. Is one of the most important potential energy functions in physics. 
because it describes with high accuracy the basic behavior of many real systems, as well as the consequences of small departures in X from the equilibrium in a huge variety of circumstances. For example, the vibrational state of diatomic molecules are accurately described using this potential, even though no simple classical picture of mass on a spring of the system is valid. We shall often use the abbreviation SHO for a simple harmonic oscillator. We begin a per, with a preliminary inspection of the SHO potential and the qualitative results that follow from its parabolic shape. For given shows of energy above the minimum of the potential, we automatically divide the x-axis into three regions. So this is what the potential function looks like right here. some constant okay so let's go back to our notes right here can anyone see this i don't even even though it's, it looks like it's not super crisp. All right. Uh, so the thing we don't quite understand is why the mass term is there. Why this is there. I think the mass term is there because we need to have F equals MA. And if we know the force, if force is proportional to X, so X is proportional, is there X is equal to C, X L dot, which is equal to A, you think you divide my mass term there? Hmm. All right, let's, uh, I think I need to read more and then come back to this. Uh, where are we? For a given choice of energy above the minimum of potential, we automatically divide the x-axis into three regions. The point of demarcation being those values x equals x plus or minus x naught at which equals v. The two points mark the limits of displacement of a classic harmonic oscillator of the energy E. In contrast to the square well, the width of this parabol parabolic well as measured by 2x is greater for higher energies. Inside any well, as we saw in chapter 3, the wave function curves back towards the x-axis as x varies, but in this case, not sinusoidally, since the potential varies with position. Outside decrease in magnitude created this as well, but in this case, not exponentially again, because potential varies with position. Okay. You recall from chapter three, other qualitative features, the correct wave function for balance states. Uh, Differential equation obtained by substituting into the general one-dimensional Schrodinger equation is this, okay, which is what we have. Given this single equation, our task is reduced to finding each value of E for which the associated wave function psi falls towards zero at large distance. To begin looking for acceptable functions of psi, we use an op from far from the center of force. So we're jumping away here. Um, hmm. 
Maybe I want to read through all of this, then go back and look at some of these points again. You know what? It's uh, five minutes to the end of my kind of predefined break. Let me just switch back. I'll just do a quick little recap of where we are. So um, I, I worked on prompts at five. Uh, like the other ones, it's been super challenging. So I think... It's now time to switch over, try to work on developing some understandings of some of the fundamental concepts that are a little fuzzy. And one of them is going to be, now we're switching on to harmonic oscillators. I felt like it was a good time to understand the two principal ways that we've solved this thing and try to really understand every single little piece so that when we're tackling problems, we kind of get it, or I kind of get it more. Now, um, the, yeah, the problems we were doing, I mean, question two was uh, not terribly bad numerically once we had some of these equations up. Um, this, this first one, as you can see, is just a complete, complete mess of, um, of things. Although the approach I was taking was right, it looks like there was just some difficulties in just processing the, this integral and making sure everything canceled out. So that's going to be something that I need to practice with. What I'm doing right now is I'm trying to basically go through the textbook explanation for how we're going to derive the um, Schrodinger equation one dimension. And then I think I'm going to go back to the lecture and look at it a little bit more in more detail so that we can kind of understand each point as it's happening in the steps to try to get our head around um, this approach to solving it. Um, so I first want to just kind of get a basic understanding of harmonic oscillators. Generally, um, I feel like I understand them. This was something that was covered quite a bit in uh, in Physics 1 of like the pendulum and this kind of thing. Uh, I'm just trying to make sure that I understand all the basics super well so that when I go forward and try to understand this in the quantum mechanical case, I've got kind of a better understanding. So that's probably what I'm going to do this afternoon is work through this um this Feynman technique and then uh we'll see I might also do the operator method one uh today as well if I could finish up both of those I think I would be pretty pleased um it's again looking like it's more challenging than I had um than I had expected for some of these problem sets for some of these uh questions so there's going to be a little bit of decision making of whether I want to keep drilling down on this or move forward and then go back and drill down in any case, this all has to be learned. So the work's the work. There's not really that much to change about it. But I think I'm going to stick to uh, the plan right now. I don't really worry too much about going through the lectures too soon. I think um, I'm a little bit more nervous about blowing through some of the problem sets without really understanding them or really being in a position to even attempt answers to them just because I don't have as much feedback as I would like. Like, I, I think I have this problem set of problem sets. Maybe I can get some more that have solutions, but there's not a ton. Whereas the lectures, if I don't understand them, I can always rewatch them. There's not really that feedback component, which gets kind of used up, so to speak, if you kind of make a bad attempt and then you get the answer. But then when you're trying to solve it again, you already kind of know what the answer is. So you don't have the same sort of effort of, of solving for the first time. So there's some chunks of these first five problem sets that I have left unfinished that I would like to go back to without checking the answers first. But I think I'm going to start with this. We'll see how long this takes us. Um, this is a, a tricky one, so it may take us an hour or more to go through. And uh, and I think, um, yeah, we'll, we'll work through this one. I'll try to work through the operator method, uh, get those two done today. Um, I'd like to work on some some more stuff from just just even just intro calculus that's a little fuzzy, like getting used to changing the order of integration, um, Taylor expansion, integrating by parts, um, 
just to get a little bit of a better intuition of that, I mean, some of that's just a technical method. So I've already been practicing that in some of the equations, but I might want to do some more practice. Um, yeah, we'll see. I don't know how much I can get done today. This thing is going to take a while. I think uh, I it was an entire lecture and I felt like a lot of it went over my head. So given that that was like about an hour and a half to go through, I would be surprised if it's going to take me you know, less than that time to go through it kind of carefully with a fine tooth comb. But I'm hoping that some pieces are going to fall into place. Some motivating decisions are going to fall into place. It's going to make more sense as I start going through it. Um, yeah, I, honestly, as I said before, when I was talking this morning, um, this is a challenging class for me. And at some point you just have to like, you can try to learn as effectively as possible. You can try to be, you know, I'm, as you can see, I'm, I'm doing my best here to be focused. I'm trying to make most efficient use of the problem sets that I have, um, getting the understanding, but there is a certain kind of fundamental limit that it's not like you can just through magic, understand everything immediately if there's a lot of work to be done. And so what I'm going to try to do is do as much as I can in this month and do as much as I can every single session I have to study. And then at the end of it, we're just going to have to decide, uh, you know, do we feel like we can take the exam? Do we feel we can do this? So just uh, so a few people have asked some questions. Uh, how can I start learning quantum mechanics? Well, to do this one, this particular class I'm doing 804, uh, what is recommended is having taken 801, 802, 803. So that's classical mechanics, electromagnetism, and waves, as well as 1801, single variable calculus, 1802, multi variable calculus, and 1803, differential equations. Um, probably not necessary to do everything there, although I, I, I've been finding the math they're pushing the math definitely in the problem sets here so it's not like you can easily omit you know just everything you they, they do expect you to know those things so i would recommend doing that as a starting point of course you don't have to understand it this way you could go through it a different way where you're maybe just sort of reading some books and trying to understand some of the basic math um, i'm sure there's other resources that don't necessarily take such a complicated rigorous approach to it so you might not need to, this is just to do this particular 804 class. It's recommended to have that level of understanding. So um, yeah, this is, uh, uh, I think, yeah, I think this is, um, can you define what the intensity of our why questions would be? Yeah, so well, I'm going to be working through the Feynman technique, and I'm hoping that I can kind of show how I work through it. But basically, I want everything that I write in the Feynman technique, everything I write down should be obvious to me that, oh, well, that's, of course, why that is. So, for instance, right now, for instance, I'm working on, um, you know, let me just throw this, uh, throw back up the, um, this thing here. So right now, for instance, I'm, I'm just getting the grounding, like refreshing. Okay, what's the simple harmonic oscillator? And how do we get a kind of a basic grasp of that? And one of the things is that we've we've got this um, simple harmonic oscillator where the potential is being defined by this this function, which is just this basically, <clears throat> uh, which is this SHO. But the question is, uh, why are these terms there? Well, can we understand that it's proportional to this x squared, but why is it m omega squared? Like why is that in there? And that's not clear to me right now. So I think what I'm going to do is read through this textbook understanding and then try to go back and see what was motivating that decision. Now, this might be a, a simplifying choice that, you know, they started off with just C, so it could have been anything, but we might have these M omega squared in place so that uh, we can pull it out. I think the reason, obviously, is this, this omega squared is related to the um, frequency of the various parts. But I think this is something worth uh, worth considering. So I'm going to um, leave it at this. It's 11.05. I'm going to try to come back probably 2 or depending on how much work I have to do, maybe a little bit before 2 and uh, just work on this for the rest of the day. So thanks for following and uh, I will see you this afternoon.